Welcome to Black Feathers Podcast, a true and honest conversation about disabilities for all. I am your host, Dr. Crystal Hernandez from the Cherokee Nation. Our ancestors sacrificed, prayed, and fought for our existence today. Cheyenne Arapaho, Tribal Website. Welcome to Black Feathers Podcast. This is our sophomore year, and we could not be more thrilled to be back. This is Season 2, Episode 1. It is my honor to have three guests from the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma with us today. Welcome to Black Feathers Podcast, Mary, Megan, and Carrie. I would love for each of you to take a moment and introduce yourselves, you know, who you are, what it is that you do, and anything else that you think is really important for our listener to know. I'm Mary Davenport. I'm with the Apache Tribes of Oklahoma. I'm also a Kiowa and Navajo descendant. I was born into the Tohalini clan and of the Plains Indians. And I'm a school social worker in western Oklahoma with the Cheyenne Arapaho tribes. And I tell people I'm living my long life career job. Fabulous. Okay, this is Megan. My name is Megan Hart. I am Ojibwe from the Red Lake Nation out of Minnesota. I've been here with the Cheyenne Arapaho tribe since 2003. I've also been the program director for the Cheyenne Arapaho Child Development Program since 2003 also. So I'm pushing on year 21 of being here with the tribes. Um, My main role is to oversee our federally funded child care and development fund which operates two tribally operated centers, and we operate a tribal child care assistance program that helps with um, tribal subsidies for child care services. Hello, this Thank is you. Carrie. My name is Carrie Whitlow. I am a Cheyenne Arapaho, a citizen of the Cheyenne Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. I am also Kiowa and Creek from here in Oklahoma. I have lived in El Reno all of my life, El Reno, Oklahoma. I currently serve as the executive director for the Cheyenne Arapaho Tribes Department of Education. I've been working with the Cheyenne Arapaho Tribes in a leadership slash management capacity since 2006. So I've been here for 18 years and I've been with the Department of Education for the past almost nine years this month. So I and blessed and fortunate to have a job that I enjoy. Our main priority is to help um, our Cheyenne Arapaho students and families on their educational journey. And for the Cheyenne Arapaho tribes, we focus a lot on services, program services, and how we can get those services into the hands of our people, most importantly in western rural Oklahoma. And I think our department does a really great job as far as being innovative and doing the best with what we have. Thank you. The three of you sound so diverse, but yet so unified in what your mission is in life is to really be a person of service to help our people and keep our circle strong. And so thank you for the work that you have all done. It sounds like you've been doing it for quite a while. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about some of the different programs? Each of you referenced different areas of focus, but yet a combination of area of focus as well. I would love to know more about the specific services and or the footprint and how you are serving our, our young ones um, living with disabilities, specifically intellectual and developmental disabilities, if you, if you can. So this is Carrie, and let me start off by saying, explaining more about our department. So our department is a tribal education department, um, sometimes referred to as a tribal education agency, and their primary role is to support the education of its tribal citizens. So luckily for the Cheyenne Arapaho tribe since 1962, since 1977, our tribe made education a priority. So when they did this, Years ago, they they wanted to send our tribal members to VOTEC to college after they graduated high school. They wanted them to have options, so they started giving grants to students. So since then, that was only focusing on a higher education scholarship uh, program. So since then, they've been building programs, whether through state grants, federal grants, gaming revenue money. We are now 
a department that consists of 12 tribal programs. In our tribal education department, we serve our families and students from birth to grave. So we have early childhood, we have K through 12 programs, and then we have our higher education scholarship program. And that's so many students that we serve, not only through Western Oklahoma, because that is our former reservation territory, but also throughout the United States, because we serve tribal members that live outside of our, outside of our service area. So right now, school-aged children from three to 18 years of age we have 4,031 students that are eligible for our services. Now, some of our programs can only focus on in our service area. So that's where you're gonna see where Mary's program, they, they are funded by gaming revenue. So they only serve here in Western Oklahoma, a certain age group. So, and then also Megan's program, she, re re she receives gaming revenue, state and federal. So then she has a whole different set of, uh, stipulations and students that she serves families as she serves but overall our whole mission is like i said to to support the education of our tribal citizens that journey and as long as i've been here education is just always changing it's always evolving so we have to do that as well most recently you all are aware of covid and the mental health has become an issue that we are trying to address. Uh, behavioral health, there's things that we're trying to do. But then also, you have to understand that our department is also limited sometimes too because we don't always have the money, the gaming revenue money that we need to help service everybody. So we rely sometimes on federal grants to get us money to serve, to do these certain projects. And so that's just kind of big overview, big picture of our department and then our programs that fall within our, with it under our, under our umbrella of services. So I'll go ahead and let Mary Megan talk about the programs that they work for and the services that they provide. This is Megan. Um, again, I am the program director for the Cheyenne Arapaho Child Care Program. Um, so we receive funding from the Department of Health and Human Services um, through the Child Office of Child Care. And our primary funding is to support and um, build the supply of child care, quality child care services for tribal members within our service area. So eligibility for our program um, is two-faced. We have two actual separate programs. We have our tribally operated centers, which we provide direct child care services from children from six weeks to 12 years of age, and then our tribal child care subsidy assistance program, which we help with the cost of child care. To be a partic participant in that program, you have to be income eligible and either in a work or an education program. The child has to be enrolled with a federally recognized tribe. Um, it doesn't spe specifically have to be the Cheyenne Arapaho tribe, but the child does have to be enrolled. Um, they have to live within our service area, which covers 11 counties here in Western Oklahoma. Some of the initiatives for our funding is that in our plan, when we're writing our grant, is that we state that um, we prioritize children with special needs. So children with special needs, um, they sometimes within, depending upon the type of child care they need, they, their child care provider may receive a higher tier payment for services if they need more care, if they need maybe um, for that center to focus on having more aids in there to assist with the children with special needs. We'll pay that higher rate for a child in that facility. Um, that also means that maybe that child would, um, their family may receive a break as such as with a co-payment if it's waived and determining what that special need may be. So we have a few different areas as how we service within our payment for providers with children with special needs. We also have a component that we provide grants to our tribal operated centers and to our providers that allows for um, quality initiatives. So one of our main areas that fall under quality is also helping within special needs for infants, toddlers, and school-aged children. Um, we have within our centers funding that we provide for our tribally operated centers where we provide additional training if we have children that are coming in and they're maybe being identified with a specific 
challenge. So what we do is we provide specialized training opportunities for our teachers. If something has come along where we feel like we need, um, we're able to send them for training. Uh, we're able to utilize state, um, like child care and resource, uh, referral programs that sometimes we can have trainers come in and work directly with our staff, not necessarily maybe the child at that point, but with our staff on how to work with children um, that may have some challenges that we're not 100% you know, educated and have the right training at that time, and then we're able to attain it for our staff. Um, I feel like I'm kind of talked in a circle, but um, I feel that our program is really focused on providing a really strong environment for children who do have special needs and special um, care that we can provide within our tribal community. So I will tell you, just listening to you talk about the the wide array of things that you're doing and responsibilities that you have, one of the things that I loved is that you say, no matter what it is that the child and our family is coming forward with, we will figure out how to find the right training to accommodate this quality of life and to ensure that we're providing the very thing that's going to help you. And I love that you have that philosophy. So You're thank you for sharing that, that. Just tying in on that, that is one area that um, I think that's different within our tribal, tribal child care operated centers is that we really, the last, last effort that we've ever made, we really try to exclude any ex, um, expulsions and excluding any child, child from child care. Um, we know that that's not the case in a lot of our private daycare centers. If they face a challenging behavior or, and especially in this zero to three, they tell the parent, I'm sorry, we can't provide services anymore. Um, that, unless we can, we've exhausted every resource, that is usually nothing that ever happens within our tribal child care centers. Um, so we really push for that also. You know, I love that you say that because every time that I talk to groups of people throughout the country, that is one of the things, you know, as a, as a parent of a child with special needs myself, that is one of the things that we hear often is that there is a, a disconnect between accommodation and um, inclusion for individuals who may have a unique difference or a unique challenge or a history or whatever the case may be. There's a million reasons why centers or facilities or, or people find to exclude somebody. And it's, I love the fact that you're saying that's not the approach that we take. Instead, we say, how can we include you and what do we need to do so that we make this inclusion feel more at home for you and the outcome's better. You have a positive outcome with what it is that we're doing with you. So thank you're you for welcome. doing that because it is a unique perspective and it is a twist on what we hear more often yes, than not. Yes, it changes the track that that child may be on. Um, we know that once, you know, if we can intervene and we can get those interventions in early, it just, you know, they roll out and they're able to go into Head Start and then Head Start's able to pick them up and maybe, you know, provide ongoing services there and then they're ready for school. So, yeah, we definitely want that to change for our children. And I wish we had more um, slots in our child care centers because um, a lot of our parents that we do, you know, provide in other services, sometimes they just have gone through three, four daycares and they just end up mm -hmm. having somebody keep their child at home. And I feel like that sets them back also because then they really aren't receiving any services um, once they have no connection to the outside world. You know, I loved also that you mentioned that because that's one of the things that parents talk about all the time in parent groups is that if you have exhausted, you know, the limited daycares, let's say, or the uh, preschools or Head Starts, and they are excluding your child who has uh, unique and special needs, it makes it very difficult for you to figure out how to maintain employment, how to find those socialization opportunities for your child outside of the home, and how to help your child you know, strive towards um, friends and, and, and learning from other kids and, and things like that are really stripped away from them because the systems are so backwards in the way that they think about accommodations. So, it, you know, what would, t what, what would it take to get you more slots, do you think? Well, thankfully, um, and I guess this is one thing to be thankful for the pandemic was with the extra funding that child care received with emergency funds, um, we were able to set aside, at least for one of our locations, to we're doing an expansion. 
So we're, we broke ground, we're ready to add more slots, and our waiting list is at least 60 plus kids wanting to get into this facility. So we're hoping that we can pull in some of those children into our expansion and have more space for them and get, um, our problem here in Western Oklahoma is maintaining and retaining staff. Um, I'm sure that's nationwide, but here that is one of our struggles. And so as much as I want everything in place, that's also the concern too is, okay, we gotta make sure we got some really strong staff to be able to care for the kids the way we, we love to care for them. So I'm proud to say, you know, our centers, we have a really good reputation um, and our, we love that. And we're five-star facilities, which is the um, quality rating scale here in Oklahoma. So that means that both of our tribal child care centers have attained the highest level that we can um, within the state here, within our licensing for child care. So that means we do above and beyond to maintain just not only minimum licensing, we're on tribal jurisdiction, we're on tribal land. Um, we agree and we actually want to be licensed by the state. Um, I think a lot of times people are like, why would you want to do that? And I'm like, no, it, it's really great. It, it brings in actual revenue so we can service more children, put more money back into our facilities, and that also that it has a level of expectation as to the standard that we want to keep our centers at. That's wonderful. Okay, I'm going to hand it over that. to Mary. I feel like I've been kind of talking, so I'm going to give it over to Mary. <laughs> <laughs> this is Mary. Um, I'm the school social worker with the Department of Education at the Cheyenne Rapo Tribes, and I'm working with a new, fairly new program called Academic Enrichment and Excellence, AEE for short. And we currently cover about 10 different schools in Western Oklahoma, public schools. Um, and we're hoping to expand our services, but currently we are serving fifth and sixth graders. Um, <clears throat> my services uh, at times may go past that age group just because um, there may be situations or circumstances around the students with siblings or family um, that is impacting their learning ability in the classroom. So I don't just limit the service to the fifth and sixth grader in the classroom alone. Um, as I mentioned early, this has been my lifelong dream job to have. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's in 1991 and I waited many years for communities and schools to recognize the need for school social workers and not many do, because our role is different than that of school counselors and other professionals that are needed and good in the school, but they are not the same as myself. Um, school social workers are primarily advocates. We advocate on behalf of the families and the students, and that's what I see myself as, is to be there for the student and the families and help them do the best they can and succeed over and beyond in the school systems that they are in. Um, currently, I work based off of referrals. An individual or their family can refer them to me or somebody at the school can refer them or another professional can refer a student to me for services. Um, then I meet with that students. I cover right now a great wide variety of services. I do everything from individual counseling, mental health and behavioral wise, to consultations with either students or staff at the school. Um, one of the things I have been working on is identifying and working with parents to become more active with their students that have 504s or IEPs. And this is a slow process. And a lot of it is because families and parents are not comfortable in coming forward when their student has needs or they don't have a full understanding of what's going on around them. 
So one of the things that I like to do as a professional is I like to start off with understanding where the family's coming from. Because each family has their own values and their thoughts of what the needs of a student or a child is. And if that child has need that, that are different than other children, how do they view that? Where do, where do they think that came from? Is it a cultural perspective or is it something that came from society as a whole or the community that they live in? And the other thing is I like to visit with the schools and find out with them why have they identified this student with these needs? What are the intellectual disabilities or the special needs they feel that this student has had? Give me some history. How did you come to this conclusion? And does that match up with what the parents and the families are saying? Um, sometimes there's a great miscommunication with what's going on and what the family feels and what's happening in the educational system. And hopefully I'm there to help clear up some of that miscommunication to the benefit of the student. Um, because each one of our people, regardless of what tribe you're from, we have our own history and beliefs of what happens to our children, what they grow up in, and what affects their life mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And I think that's important. That's important for us to recognize what is the value of that family? How do they feel that that's affecting their child's learning and their ability? Because if we try to force our beliefs and another system upon them that they don't feel is part of who they are, then we're disservicing them. We're just creating more hardship upon them. And so I feel like that's part of why I'm here, is to help be a voice for that and to help build that bridge and that communication, not to just convert them to a system, but to help them stand up for what is right for them and what they feel is best for them. And I think that's important because we are still working with these young people and these students in the young years. They still have a lot of transition ahead of them. They still have a lot of learning ahead of them. And a lot of times as school go from year to year, a lot of times teachers, educators, um, unintentionally get focused on what's happening that year alone. And they don't think about what's gonna happen the year after or the year after or when the student gets to high school or what's gonna happen when they're in college or how that's what they're doing now is gonna affect them down the road. But I feel like I can help that family and I can help that student and maybe even help the teachers to plan for that and to prepare for that so we're not living in cubicles year to year, but we're actually moving toward a journey that's prosperous. Because when you look at statistics, a lot of abuse that happens to elder people comes from unmet needs. It comes from disabilities of some sort or form. And one way to curb that is to help adults with disabilities and elders down the road with disabilities learn to be independent and functional as possible, early on as possible. So when I look at these students, I look at not just them as a student that's 10, 11, 12, but I envisioned them at 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, and hopefully give their parent a peace of mind that these are gonna grow into young, healthy adults that can care for themselves, 
especially when they have intellectual disabilities, giving them that understanding and knowledge that they can still have jobs, they can have careers, they can do things that they can take care of themselves and they don't have to worry about them and think that they have to be dependent on somebody else. So that's just, I think, a small, hopefully, view of what I do, which is very broad. And hopefully, um, we can add more people. And I think that is Carrie's plan. Um, and I'm, I believe we've been successful. We've been building families one at a time. Every year, my goal is to reach out one or two families a year. And so far, I've met that goal. And I just plan to keep building on that and add more people that really have a heart to service the people in Western Oklahoma. That is so beautifully stated. Can we replicate you <laughs> everywhere? Yeah, she's a <laughs> You sound, number one, what you are doing is changing the magnitude of not just the individual, the child, um, but the family as a whole and the community because you're thinking not only at the moment, but you're thinking upstream. You're thinking about what are the things that will allow you to fall down this, this hole, basically, or cause this chaos in your family and your community. How can we get ahead of it? How can we prevent it? How can we equip you as a child to become that 30-year-old? How can we equip you to be that 60-year-old? And so I think that's wonderful. The other thing that you said that really resonated with me is stop forcing the system upon the person and instead listen to the person and figure out how to support the person with the pieces of the system. And so I really do appreciate you sharing that because we do have better success when things are individualized, when we fill gaps in the person's life, but more so when the person feels valued and heard and we do not strip away those protective factors from them that keep them grounded and rooted. So wonderful. Carrie, did you want to share more? I just want to say, so this is Carrie, that um, both Megan and Mary um, we need more of them within our department, and we're currently in the process of searching for grants to kind of build on the school social worker uh, because, like she said, we're with sc we have 10 school districts we're partnered with in her program only, and there's just one of her, so we need more of her, um, not only in that role, but I think that she be able to train them because of her way of thinking is the type of thinking that is valuable and you know a great asset to our department the other thing that i want to share about both of these ladies and this is why i had asked them to join me on this podcast and this conversation because the work that they do and how long that they've been in their fields um you know they make my job easy because they they teach me they educate me about what we should be doing, what we could be doing. And so this past year, Mary, I've sat in with her some meetings um, as we built this AEE program because it did come from the result of a, a federal grant with the Office of Indian Education. And so it was an NYCP grant. And what was unique about that grant is because they wrote in a school social worker and that has never been included ever before here with any of our grants. Um, we saw that there was a need for our families and sometimes that's, um, like she said, where, where we live in Oklahoma, in Western Oklahoma, it's these rural communities. We are on former reservation territory. Our kids are always going to be different and not in a bad way, but just because we, our kids are identifiable, meaning that they look native our boys still have braids. Our names are still reflective of, um, you know, our original families. We have Young Bear. We have White Skunk here in Western Oklahoma. And so when our, when our, our students are stepping and our families into these school districts, like you said, with a system, we all know the education system was not built for us, um, for, for us to succeed um, in this system where there's distrust where there's discrimination, there's prejudice, and the school system looks nothing like them. So they don't have teachers, they don't have counselors, administrators, nobody that looks like them. They, the, 
the curriculum isn't reflective about who they are as Shiner Apple people. Um, not even indigenous people are included in the, that curriculum or those books. And so there's a lot of distrust from our families with the school district, but this is where all of our students go to school is in these public school districts. And so our role as an education department is to, even myself, you know, going to a public school district in a predominantly white system where, you know, your identity some kind, sometimes comes, um, is affected by that because, like I said, you, you don't see yourself in this system. In your home, you do. At school, you don't. And so whenever you're um, experiencing the discrimination or the prejudice because of the way that you look, um, that affects your identity and it affects how you feel about yourself um, when walking into the system. And so even us, when we're going into these school districts and wanting these partnerships, we have to put that bias aside to say, I'm here to make the experience of our students and families better now, meaning that we let's create a partnership, let's have a positive working relationship where when our students come through here, they're gonna benefit from our services because we can work together. We have shared values now. We have shared um, educational outcomes for our students and families, meaning that you know, if you're receiving impact aid, you're receiving Title VI dollars, you're receiving JOM, all of these services that um, sometimes they need to understand why they're receiving those services and they don't um, because of treaties, because you know, we exchange land for, in exchange for that. They promise us education and health care and all of these things, food. Um, and so our job is to get those, fam those administrators, those school districts, those teachers, those counselors that our students, you know, may look different. They may have a different experience, but they're just as worthy as your predominantly white students here in this system. And it, I mean, I, I don't mean to be, I don't know how to say this, but, you know, we're kind of located towards Oklahoma City where we live in El Reno, where Concho's located. But the further west that you go, the smaller the town gets. And sometimes the experience, you know, gets worse in those areas because um, there's not a lot of people out there that look like us. And so slowly we're trying to make things better, but like Mary said, it's it's a slow process, um, but we're hoping that it, it's helpful to our families and that they, one thing where I can say that where we've made improvement is that our families do trust us. They're, they're, we're, we're earning their trust, meaning that they email us and they call us when they have a situation and they either want our feedback or they want us to sit in a meeting with those school districts just to make them feel comfortable going in. Um, so that happens a lot where we just act as liaisons and helping, you know, the family understand the school district and vice versa, the school district understanding the family. Um, but I believe that begins because we're fortunate, like I said, our department, we start offering services in early childhood from zero to 13 years of age. And then we have Head Starts that's included. And I would have invited her today, but she's on um, vacation leave today. Um, so we have Head Starts in three Head Starts in Western Oklahoma, and then we start picking up those students with those students with services from K through 12. So, I mean, we're, I think we're making progress. We're trying, we're expanding constantly, trying to think of how we how we can get more funding to expand our services um, and the need that you know our families have. I love that you mentioned just the evolution of, of things and the trust that you have to build because a lot of times, you know, one of the graphics that I talk about when I talk about equitable services, um, there's a graphic I use and it's about, it's a large building. It's very tall. On top of this building, there are all these utopia of services. So housing, um, you know, food security, safety, mental health, um, education um, services, protection, advocacy, all of these things are on top of this tall building. Down the side of the building, there's thorns and vines and protrusions. And then there's a secret elevator that takes a key. And you see this heavily resourced person walking up to that elevator swinging their key because they already have the resource, meaning the special key to get to the things 
up there that are unattainable to the average person. And then down the side, you have individuals looking up, number one, not even realizing what it is that's up there, how to navigate it, let alone how they're going to get it. And there are brown people, individuals with disabilities, there are um, uh, all walks of life that are typically kept out of the system structure. And on the side of this graphic, it says difficult to reach population or difficult to reach services. You decide and do better. Level the building. Stop building systems and things that are unattainable for the very people that need to attain the things to have a well, happy, quality life that is not cut prematurely and they are not forced into systems that are punitive, harmful, or chaotic. And so everything you just described is reflective of that unattainable system. But I'm glad that you're recognizing that the system is evolving and that you all are serving as those trusted allies to help the system shift for the very people that it's intended to keep out, Absolutely. you know, or, or to yes. keep down or to keep yes, in chaos. I agree. Absolutely. And I just wanted to tie in on some, this is Megan with um, child care. And one thing that I, kept thinking when both of um, Carrie and Mary were talking was also that I had not mentioned and just on our partners, um, reaching for outside services such as with within our tribal child care centers, we do work with the um, health departments. And so we have health, the health department come into our child care centers and they do screenings. So we start screenings, we do them four times a year. Every quarter we um, do early childhood screenings. So they cover developmental, autism, vision, and hearing. Um, and we think it's great. Um, we think we're catching um, things a lot earlier for to get in services and intervention. Um, one thing that we have looked at and seen is where this is helping build some of our parents' um, comfort and relationship with outside agencies. Um, we have seen, you know, maybe the first time that something's kind of brought up, hey, you know, maybe we need to do further evaluation. We're seeing possibly, you know, there may be something going on. And parents are now, you know, hesitant. They don't really want to be on board for that. But maybe then in the next three months, they're starting to see things themselves. And then when we come back to the table and we do another assessment, that they're like, okay, hey, yeah, maybe maybe I, I do want to hear about this. Maybe I am interested. Maybe I will reach out to, you know, let's at least start with speech. You know, let's at least start with something so we can get kind of get their foot in the door and for them to get more comfortable. Uh, because a lot of times when our families hear Department of Health, they also think of DHS. And they have, you know, we have this long history with, foster care system, removal of children, the distrust. So a lot of times they just don't want the government or the state to really be in their business. And sometimes that does bring a barrier, I'm not saying that's all families, but I think with us just bringing them in, getting the conversation going, um, it's really open doors. Um, we've had some really wonderful stories of success, of early diagnosis, which meant, you know, getting a screening, a vision screening, um, which we know those are supposed to happen at your pediatrician. But I will tell you how many times pediatricians aren't even asking the white, white, right questions, and our parents don't know what to be telling a pediatrician. So a lot of that goes unseen until they maybe are entering the school. And then the school starts and say, hey, we have something we really need to consider looking at. This child may need to be on an IEP, we may need to get them further evaluation. So I think on our end that for for the, the partnership that we have with the county, Department of Health has has been amazing. I mean, I really love that, and they're fully 100% engaged. I feel that, like I said, even the parents that we may have some hesitation from and acceptance, it's hard to hear, hey, there may be some challenges that your child is going to face for the rest of their life, you know, a lot of times of finding those services and being there for them to support them and say, you know, hey, we know, we know that this isn't easy and there's, you know, and getting to the point, there's nothing wrong with your child because at first, that's the first thing you, you hear, oh, there's something wrong. They're, they're, you know, my child's broken or, you know, I mean, not, there's just something that's not, you know, and that's not the way we want them to, to feel or, to, and, you know, they're just learning different. They're going to learn different or if there's a physical, like, I think our first time um, was years ago 
with um, child that, you know, presented some challenging behaviors and, you know, just not knowing in our own right, like I said, with us doing training back then was of how many different sensory disorders there are. Not everything falls under the autism spectrum. There's other things that are out there and other ways to work with our kids. And it's just finding that, finding the resources and the support. But that is just something that I think, just like what Carrie had said too, about just building those partnerships, building that trust with our families, you know, that we're doing everything that we can to provide the child care services that they need to have them ready for school is just ultimate goal. But just to help them if they do need the additional services that we know where to reach out. Like she said, in western Oklahoma, we have some really strong counties. Um, the county we're in, they partner with the tribe across the board. We can get mental health. We can get every service you can imagine you know, go a few counties over more into western Oklahoma, they don't have the personnel, they just, you know, they just don't have the services in those areas. So it just kind of depends on where you fall out within the county, but the county here that covers El Reno is, and Concho is really, in the school system here, um, really partners well with the tribe. I think this is our real pilot area of showing this is how we can all work together to provide services for our children because even though they start here, they will be eventually be in those public school systems. Thank you. I would like to hear a little bit more. You mentioned you have screenings of various types and you start very young and you do them quarterly. So when you do recognize on those screeners that there's a need for further diagnostic testing, for example, for intellectual and developmental disabilities, autism, things like that, what happens then? Do you have, again, I'm just going to say, anywhere that I go in this country, but you're talking about rural Oklahoma, how many diagnostic providers are actually out there? And are you also seeing the wait time for families to get evaluations completed? Are you jumping in? Oh, yes. Um, well, we, the Department of Health, they have a child behavior specialist that c comes with, you know, and she'll do her referrals out. She'll also and a lot of times that might be to Sooner Start, which is a program here in Oklahoma that provide, provides those services for children from zero to three. Um, I think the one thing that we've seen happen is sometimes those kids don't become eligible for that program, even though they should be. Um, they refer them back to the pediatrician to get those referrals out. So I think a lot of times for things to be covered, it has to actually be sent out by the pediatrician. I'm not 100% on that, but that's usually where our we go is they'll get a referral to Sooner Start or back to their pe pediatrician to get that um, ball rolling for them in that area. Now, have we seen, like once they're three and older, that usually, from my understanding, is covered um, if they don't go into our Head Start program here is that the local public school is supposed to cover them. Um, is that your guys' understanding too? Yes. Okay. So um, for here, so a lot of times the one thing we for sure can get them into is speech. I hate that that, I mean, I shouldn't hate. I'm glad we do have a door. You know, that opens the door. So maybe they get in the speech. Then they say, oh, well, let's get them evaluated with occupational therapy, you know, specialists to come in. Let's do developmental specialists to come in, you know, and do an evaluation. So is it all inclusive and covers every spectrum and, you know, we get everything that our children need? I I think there's a defi definitely a, what do you call it, a gray area on that. IHS is a big um, service provider for a majority of our families. They're very limited. A lot of times they may, I'm not sure how many providers they actually even have that do those evaluations now. Um, this is Mary. Okay. Um, the IHS in Western Oklahoma has really been struggling in the last two years to stay staff, fully staff, even in their behavioral health. Um, and the service providers that they do have or um, via Zoom or telehealth. That's what I meant to say, telehealth. Um, and that's not something you can always do when you need to do assessment and testing. My last um, information, which may not be current, was there was still a two to three month waiting list um, just to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist in Western Oklahoma. So that's pretty lengthy. 
Um, however, in other parts of Oklahoma as a whole, um, just to have an evaluation or assessment is up to six months. Some are told a year waiting list. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's definitely on par with what I've heard. Uh, again, depending on your payer source, your region, um, who you know, who you don't know. Again, d going back to that shiny key with the resource, right? Your wait time can be six months a year and in some instances longer. And so I was just curious if you all were seeing that similar type of pattern. And I know Indian Health Services, um, IHS is definitely working towards, you know, trying to staff up. And I know that you know, anywhere you go in this country, healthcare is is very difficult to one find staff that are you know available to quality staff and three keep staff. And so I, I know that you all are sharing that you're seeing some of those similar types of things there, and that impacts unfortunately you know uh, ability to get into services, speed in in which you can get into services, and the robust structure or lack thereof of services. So, but yeah, the screening is important. All of those things are really important for us to continue to do because our our kiddos need that, our families need that, and you know, I too have have gone that journey where you are anxious, you are worried, you are trying to figure this out, and then sometimes you have, uh, you know, that that moment where families aren't ready to accept that information, and and when they do accept that information, then they don't know what to do with it because there are a lack of service providers for various things across the board when you're dealing with intellectual and developmental disabilities in particular. So I, I completely understand that, and I also have heard over and over the similar thing that you mentioned. We may cover as a tribe, we may cover 10, 9, 8 counties, 11 counties, 14 counties, but they're not all resourced the same, and not all partnerships are available the same way because of you know either their own limited resources, politics, um, distrust, or, or whatever. And so I know that we've talked about a number of things um, in a in a long short period of time, and I was just curious, you know, what else are you seeing when you're looking at these? these families and these children with intellectual and developmental disabilities, what additional opportunities do you see in the future to better serve our, our Native kids in more comprehensive ways if there was funding available, if there were grants available, or partnerships? What, what would your dreams be to better serve these individuals? This is Mary. I would say with the population that I serve, the first thing that comes to mind is something in the form of transitional services. Because I mentioned the cubicle perception that seems to occur with some of the educational system, not intentionally, but you know, unintentionally. Um, but definitely some kind of transitional service. I, th I believe that the tribes, we are able to do that at a certain degree. But overall, I think there needs to be more transitional services, helping them in some form as well as maybe for those that need it, a more of a form of a wraparound service, possibly. Yep. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else have any thoughts about if you had a, the ability you know, to, to find funding, what would those opportunities that you'd love to seize to, you know, change the system or continue to enhance the system for individuals and families? What would that this look is like? Megan, and I think in early childhood education, um, and I'm just speaking tribe, you know, within a tribal system, um, if what I would love to see, let's say I had a magic wand and had all the money in the world, would be our own assessment um, specialist, our own um, trainers, um, our own, like, occupational therapist, our own, um, just our services here that, where we would have that within house so we wouldn't have to source out um, within the various communities that we would have that on hand that we would be able to provide that for our own tribal members and the kids that we services and, uh, service and their families. Uh, of course, that would be a huge wish list. Um, and I, I think too for us within tribal child care, is just having in-house um, within our own facilities of just the extra training, um, the intense training. A lot of times when we are receiving training, it's more of a theory-based, 
and we can take as many of those challenging behavior classes and different things like that, but for really intensive, hands-on, here's what you do in, you know, in the classroom, coaching, just different, you know, just different resources like that that would really support and strengthen our child care centers. I believe that we are doing what we can with the um, resources we do have, but wish list would just have that every day within our facilities. This is Carrie. I'll just add that my big dream and vision is just to create our own system that is inclusive of education, mental health, um, behavioral, where we have these wraparound services where we have strong early childhood, we have strong Head Start, and even they work very well together in providing services to their families and students. So Head Start's prepared, that child goes to the Head Start. Then Head Start, depending on where the, the student goes to school after that, they have a relationship with those school districts and preparing, or even have op open communication to say, hey, we're having this issue, did you have the same issue? Yes, and they get on the same page. But um, currently, we are working on a model for a charter school, our own charter school, um, which hopefully, you know, someday will be open. Um, Someday, hopefully, we could have a, tri a tribally controlled school system. We have our own, um, what else? Maybe an immersion school, something like that along the line, you know, somewhere down the line. But um, my big vision and big goal is just that we are educating our own tribal citizens with everything, with, with everything that we know that they need. Um, you know, education really here focuses on um, standardized test, um, you know, how we determine success is just different how, you know, our community defines success. And usually that's centered around, you know, knowing who you are and where you come from, having a strong identity, knowing your culture, knowing your language, um, knowing our values and our stories. So my hope is that you know, we, we are having these conversations because we have a grant right now. Mary's included in these conversations, and she's making sure that are we going to offer special education? Are we going to offer these services that she talks about? And so hopefully someday that will be a reality, but um, that's, that's the big goal and big, big vision. Hopefully someday we'll achieve. sounds like you guys are doing tremendous work with the resources you have and you're really looking at the ways that you can stretch those resources. But I love also hearing about what your grand vision is if additional resources were made available to you. You know, I think that the future of our people is so incredibly important to, to think about now, every moment. Like Mary said, you can't just think about today. You have to think about tomorrow and five years from now and all of those things because They'll be here before we know it. We need stronger ties to who we are, and we need to be able to have the resources that are all around us that have been historically kept from us. And I think it's so important for us to share this information, share the programs and the efforts that are going forward all over um, Indian country because this is the thing that is going to drive our people back into the spaces and places that they were once removed from. Absolutely. So with that said, is there anything that you all would love to share either about what you're doing, personal journeys related to intellectual and developmental disabilities, or, or anything that you think um, would be really important to have the listeners here? We Native, we know that our dreams really, um, really talk to us and make make us you know who we are and a lot of times you know a lot of our tribal communities you know we do a lot within our dreams and I just reflecting this morning on a dream that I had last night where um, I was really fortunate growing up I grew up on Red Lake so if you're familiar with Red Lake it's a close or one of the one of two closed Indian reservations in the United States and we're pretty close to the Canadian border and so I grew up there and was raised on Red Lake by my parents, and my dad was a phenomenal dad. He was making the changes that we needed in our life 
to grow up where he was breaking the generational curses that we all were suffering with alcoholism and um, he was really a leader in the forefront for Minnesota in the world of chemical dependency. I thought I was going to be a chemical dependency counselor. Uh, my bachelor's degree is in social work with a minor in chemical dependency. And my early career, I did counseling and just was like, my dad was my hero. Well, his coworkers, which a man by the name of Adam Lusher and Lee Lusher, they were some of, there's, there's more of the guys that were part of that. But they were in my dream this morning. And I remember just hearing them talk and laugh and joke. And I was thinking of the power of the dream as to where I could hear their voices. I could hear that laughter and I could feel that like it just felt like when I woke up this morning, it's been a really hard year for me, hard two years for me um, personally. But when I heard that in my dream, you know, I felt myself at the end of the dream knowing that this was a dream. And you know how that feels where you just start in your dream to cry. And I woke up like that. And I felt like empowered and thinking of what those guys did for us and how they were as you know, breaking the way for their kids and us and just being that for us and um, providing that for us. And this is Red Lake, you know. I mean, this is way north, you know, reservation life and stuff. And so I really reflected on that this morning. And I did feel myself tearing up again, you know, just missing them and feeling like how we can be that for and continue to be that. Like, that's that's our job here. That's our job within our communities. And I moved into Cheyenne Arapahoe community, and I have been accepted. I think Mary can say the same mm -hmm. thing, too, being from her tribes, that um, this is my other home. You know, I feel connected to both communities, and I think that's the one thing that's beautiful about us as being Native people is that that connection, that family, that acceptance, and I hope that we're providing that for the families that we're providing services for. And I think that's what Carrie really envisions for our tribal education department here is that we're, you know, we're not, this these departments, we're not like, we're providing the services. Yes, we're doing a job and yes, you know that, but it's for our community, it's for our future of our kids. It's to support any of our children, no matter what they're facing, what challenges they're facing, what possible disability that they may be facing, that that doesn't keep them from, you know, being part of our community, being accepted in our community. Well, this is Mary. I think what I would like to say is that I think families can remember that there's always hope for the future, that our students and our children do have a future. And when we invest in them and we believe in them, just like our ancestors, our grandmas and grandpas have taught us, you know, that means, means something. Because I think about my grandpa you know, I only knew him up till I was five years old. But the short memory I have of him lasted me a lifetime. And it gets me through some really hard days sometimes. And so whatever love and compassion that you have to offer your nieces, your nephews, your grandchildren, don't ever think it's not enough because it is. It might be that very act that gets them through that day and their lifetime. Hope is a powerful thing. Thank you for sharing that, Mary. Judge not by the eye, but by the heart. Our first teacher is our own heart. Cheyenne Sane. We want to thank our listeners and hope that you'll continue to listen, subscribe, share, and provide readings and reviews. Also, follow us on Twitter at Black Feathers Pod. You can get resources and information about this podcast at blackfeathers.org. Thank you to Cherokee National Treasure, Tommy Wildcat, for the use of your flute music on this podcast. I want to thank Lucas Frazier and the boys for letting us use their drumming music.
please subscribe to Black Feathers Podcast. You can find us wherever podcasts are found. We would love to hear from you. Tell us about your journey with disability and guide us on future episodes of Black Feathers by visiting blackfeathers.org and answering a few short questions at the bottom of that page.